Yeah, I'm Mike Dodge. I work at Facebook. We're um, a part of the client platform engineering team. We do all things desktop. Um, yeah, this is a lot of content to cover, so I'm going to gloss over some stuff. I realize I'll probably talk really quickly too, but hopefully this is enough for you to get started playing with it on your own. Okay, so originally when I started uh, you know, thinking about this talk, I titled it to 12,000 Max and Beyond um, with Chef. Um, but right after doing my proposal, I realized we had already snuck up to 15,000 Max. And like you heard from the Google guys and I'm sure others, um, your fleet will you know, grow over time, and I can say firsthand, I'm sure those guys can too, scale can be scary, especially if you don't have the right tools in place, um, you don't have the right processes in place to handle these sort of things. Um, but if you do, your, your fleet could like double overnight and you shouldn't even feel it. Um, so um, if you've seen any of my other talks, we have a lot of these red posters up all over the place, and they're mantras that we live and work by. Um, one of them that uh, we like to recite to ourselves quite often is, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Um, this one, what it means for us is every so often we look at our tools and ask ourselves, um, if I forgot everything that I did previously up until now, what would I do? And starting from scratch. Um, so over the, over the past, you know, forever, we originally started out with Bash and Casper, but if you, as you've heard today, stop using Bash, right? Like if it's over 10 lines, like some others said, just don't use Bash. Um, what that meant for us was Python, and that's great. Um, using Python with Jamf worked well for, for quite some time. What we ended up doing was using um, the Casper API along with Python to do some really creative stuff. But we started to feel uh, really limited by what was available to us, like built in through the API. There was just this one thing we'd want to change here, or this one thing we wanted to change here. And uh, because Jamf is you know, closed source, we weren't able to do some of those things. Um, also, um, as a growing client team, you know, no longer just me, there was a few others, we were clobbering each other's changes by editing the same policies or um, without source control, you hire an intern for the summer, he leaves, you know, come winter, you're like, when, w this stopped working, why did it stop working? And of course you have no audit trail to understand, you know, exactly what happened. So yeah, so then next was a big huge shift for my team, but not for Facebook as a whole, because Facebook as a whole is really big about open source. Um, it, it offers you endless customizability and um, it gives you the opportunity to share with the communities that originally build these tools or people that you know want to get started. Um, so obviously we started using Monkey, which you can see up there and you've heard a lot about today. We're going to go a little bit of how we deploy it using Chef, um, but Chef. We deployed it a year ago and my team loves Chef. There's just nothing we can't do with Chef. Um, well, why? You know, what's special about Chef? Um, at Facebook, we're obviously a software company, um, and um, one of our, uh, or sorry, one of Chef's mantras and some of the stuff that they talk about very frequently is how Chef enables infrastructure as code. Um, and obviously, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, but if you want me to dig in, it's basically Imagine your entire uh, fleet of servers, usually in the case when they're talking, um, but sometimes clients, and writing a configuration file that will uh, uh, represent the state of those given machines at any time. So that aligned really well with one of our mantras, which is code wins arguments. Um, when we started doing a uh, internal pilot um, with Chef and a few other you know, um, tools, we decided to go with Chef because, um, well, one, we, there is a Chef presence already internally, but um, we found that it was the easiest to set up, the easiest to scale, and it just made the most sense to us. Um, so yeah, next was transparency. Um, because there was already a chef presence in our environment, and because it's using all the same tools that we use internally for uh, code pushes and things of that sort of nature, um, anyone in our um, environment could actually see the changes that were going as they were going, um, or, um, quite often explain to us why we were doing something wrong and give us a pull request in how to fix it. So it made us uh, able to move much faster. Uh, deterministic. This one's a little harder to explain. I wish I put a graphic up there. But basically, imagine if you had 10 things that you wanted to configure. And along that configuration on number four, it fails. Um, with some configuration tools, 
it would still keep going. And then uh, what happened, right? What is the, the state of your machine when it was done? Um, with Chef, if it ever uh, runs into an error, it halts and nothing else is done. So you know exactly where the given state is of any machine in your fleet, including the ones that are failing. Uh, item potent, it doesn't change anything unless it needs to be changed. Um, client side computation, this basically means it scales very well. Uh, my production team, um, in some testing, really, I think it was them messing around, uh, got 40,000 uh, servers all talking to one Chef server and it just Held it, no problem. Um, well, I've already mentioned this a little bit, but it's very uh, flexible. There was nothing that we couldn't change or uh, adapt to our, the, own, uh, the way we like to do things. Um, so this is just a random list of things that we want from a tool. You've actually heard a lot about some of these stuffs today, uh, like source control, code linters. Um, with uh, Chef, it uses RubuCop or Food Critic, which I forgot. Um, it enables us to use code review, and we use data tools uh, with it very closely. Um, and then coding practices, like we wanted to build abstractions once and not have to think about like the, the implementations of certain things over and over again. Um, it works well with our sharding rollouts, and uh, it really fit, uh, fit these last two, which was the right tool for the job. Many times, um, you know, we were in the past forcing Bash to do things it wasn't intended for. And this was a good example of like just it works perfectly. I haven't really found a place where I'm stretching it um, further than than I should. And then reuse and share. Um, at some point, we're going to um, really invest a lot of time to go back and rewrite our initial uh, rollout, such that it's a little bit um, more digestible for the public and anyone can just grab it and hopefully run it on your systems. Um, so how Chef works. Um, it's actually very similar to other tools if you've like looked at Puppet and, and such. Um, they have actually a really good video, like just you know, very high level of how it works. Um, but we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit just real quickly. Um, imagine this is your fleet. Those are your, your, your Macs, and that's your Chef server. Typically, they'll want you to run um, a command called knife upload, which is very similar to like um, you know, Casp uh, Casper admin, and you upload your policies or you know, in this case, cookbooks and recipes and um, all of that to the server. Um, we use something called grocery delivery. So we actually check in all of our recipes and cookbooks and configurations into Git. And then grocery delivery actually just applies those changes to all of our servers. But imagine that ran. So cool. We have all our cool stuff in the server. And then the next time our clients check in, they'll download the, the new configuration changes, but will only apply any changes that need to be made to their system. And all the compute is getting done locally on the client side. So other than serving up the, the configuration files, there's very little stuff going on on the server. Um, the anatomy of a chef run is, is, is fun to look at. It's very small up here. We're not going to go over this by detail, but I just wanted to go over it. So basically, you start a chef run. It builds the node object that will be passed to the rest of the recipes and cookbooks. And then it will use that to do any like um, variable um, assignment to, you know, variables that you define in your cookbooks. Um, it re registers with the Chef server. Um, it does its auth authentication that you would have had to little, do a little bit of bootstrapping to initiate in the first place. It synchronizes cookbooks, and then it loads a whole bunch of stuff in this order, which is like libraries, providers, resources, um, attributes, uh, definitions, and recipes. We're only going to be touching attributes and recipes today, and we'll talk a little bit about the node object, but OK. So then it's going to run the converge, only changing what needs to be changed, and then it'll save the node object, um, and it's done. That's a lot. Um, there's another link right there if you actually want to just learn more about Chef um, and, and the, um, the actual anatomy of a, a given chef run. Whew. Okay, so not all sunshine and rainbows. When I first started using Chef um, last year, I mean, it worked out of the box, but nothing was like perfect. Um, there was a few things that I, I, I disliked. Oh, I've talked to Chef since then. One of them that was like, I went to LearnChef.io, and when you went to their site, you wouldn't have even known that it ran OS X. Um, they gave you examples for Linux, Windows, Ubuntu, and they reference every node as a server. So um, you, again, would, does it run on clients? You know. But if you stick with it and you go a little further, which I definitely encourage any of you guys that are interested in Chef to use these tutorials, they're actually pretty good. 
Um, you can you can just replace the word server and uh, with client in your in your head, and then read some of this documentation. And it's actually still pretty good. So like this is it talking about a given file resource, and then uh, naming it with a path of message of the day. Here's the content, and that's all you're doing. You're describing the state of that file. Chef will ensure that that file is in that state, and it, it's not how it needs to be done, just what the end state should look like. Okay, and yeah, keep keep uh, keep with learn.chef.io. Uh, There's some good stuff there. So yeah, now you install the Chef development kit, which you will do in the um, the learn.chef.io. This is great. Like it works with Mac OS 10 out of the box, and now it's starting to look like, hey, it actually does run on a Mac. Um, and this is very much like the uh, Casper suite. This is the knife tool. This is the Chef command that will automatically generate cookbooks, like a boiler template for you, recipes, um, stuff like that. So definitely uh, download that, play with that. Um, originally, when the the default service provider, when I got it, um, it didn't load launch agents in the correct context. So it was uh, loading them as root and not as user. Um, recently, I, got, I put up a pull request that pretty much rewrote how the service provider works. And now it loads launch agents in the correct context as the console user. So yeah. Um, and then, so now it's demo time. And I really wanted to like spend some time on doing some really great stuff. But I'm trying to like cram it all in. So it kind of just said, we'll do it live. Also, yeah, so let's just look at this real quick. This is like my chef repo. And inside there is the uh, a whole bunch of cookbooks that we're going to go over. And then um, one of them is this example recipe or cookbook that has an attributes file. And we were talking about the uh, Chef um, Anatomy run. First, before Chef ever runs, something called OHI runs, which is very similar to Factor, or if you think about all the extended attributes that you would write for Casper, it's a bunch of you know, data that you're going to um, potentially query about the machine and in a structured object that you can pass all around. Well, each time it goes to a cookbook, it expands upon that for that cookbook with um, a default attributes file. Then it comes to the re uh, recipes directory. And by default, it'll call the default recipe. Um, and you can specify whether or not to add these to your run list um, uh, individually. So let's try this now that we turn off the lights a little bit. There you go. Cool, yeah. OK. Not too bright. Not too bright. <laughs> OK. So, so we were talking about basically um, the node object runs, and it creates this object called node dot whatever. Um, in a given um, re a cookbook, which we are looking at the example, so let's clean up some of this other stuff. Um, yeah, files we don't need that yet. In the attributes, there's this file called default. We are creating an, an like appending to the node object with example name and example username, Mike Dodge and uh, M Dodge, which is the corresponding names. We come in here, and this is actually the recipe. It's, if you look at it, um, it looks very code-like, but it's also very English. So it's, we're telling it to log welcome to chef, and um, then we're telling it to um, load the node attribute example name. So this is going to obviously be replaced with Mike Dodge. Um, this is the, lo the log level. We're telling to log as um, info, which is just the default. Then we're specifying what the username is. And um, the node object and any attributes can be based on Ruby code or um, shell outs or any of that. But we just specified what the username was in this case. And then we're saying that this file, uh, users, username, uh, which will be mdodge, desktop, chef test dot text is going to be are going to have the content of hello world. Uh, it doesn't need to be uh, specified as a string like that. You can actually specify it as anything that you generated on the fly or dynamically. We're setting the, the owner and the mode. And um, now if we can get over here, and we're going to uh, run this as root, because you have to be root. Cool. And then because I don't have my stuff set up, we need to do uh, cool. 
All right, so we're going to run um, just the default chef command, which is called chef client. Um, and then we're going to specify that we want to run it locally with a chef zero run. And then we're going to override the default um, configuration with O, which would be your run list that you essentially configure in the client RB or through the, the node object on the server. But we're, we didn't do any of that, so we're just running chef client zero override and telling it what to write run, which, which is going to be example colon colon one to say it's the first recipe. And when we run it, it's going to chef zero actually like spins up its own little instance of chef and then looks at that cookbook and starts uh, just running the, the, the recipe code. So in this example, um, it did the, exactly what we thought it would, where it's um, logging, hey, welcome to chef, here's my touch, okay, cool. And then this file didn't exist, oh, or it, mm, or it did already, so it didn't do anything. Um, but let's just delete that or um, add to it real quick. Um, desktop, and what do we call it, chef test, yeah. So yeah, it says hello world, but we're gonna add, um, you know, rogue whatever and now if we run chef again um, I was wondering why that first time we're in really quickly but yeah so now it's gonna look at the file on disk realize that it doesn't actually match what, what, what we're expecting it shows you the the Delta and what it's removing which is that and yeah there you go it's only gonna run and show you or uh, make the changes that it needs to that's also a very simplistic um, thing that, like, I mean, if you think about it, we deal with a lot of files, but um, this is very, very primitive, right? We, we want to see something a little bit more complex. So um, if we go to this one, um, this, we're going to do a few things. We're going to create a bunch of directories um, in this file structure um, because this is where I want to keep my scripts, per se. And so we created this array, which is library CPE, and then inside that is library CPE lib, and then you can see. And we're, we're, we're running or iterating over this array with a dot each, passing it to the directory resource um, as directory each time, or dir. So now we're saying directory, and then each one of these, create it with a mode of this, owner of this, will of this. So it's going to create those directories, unless for some reason they already do, in which it'll just validate that it has the correct permissions and then keep going on. Um, this is me dropping a script, and this is where uh, things get a little different, because earlier you saw me use file, but now I'm using cookbook file. And what this is, is we're actually shipping some files with the cookbook itself, and in this case, it, it's just this script. You see it right here. So when we say cookbook file, it knows to look for the source file um, in this file structure of the cookbook, and we're telling it where to put it and what permissions. Now, the same thing comes when we're going to do a whole bunch of launch daemons. They're all inside the files, and we're telling cookbook file to place them in the appropriate location. And um, in this case, we're, we're adding one additional thing where we're telling it, if you change the file on disk, I want you to notify the service to get restarted. So it'll unload it and reload it again. And of course, the first initiation of this run, um, it, it'll tell it to enable it unless it's already been enabled, and then you're good to go. So this is probably something very similar that you guys would potentially do with packages, but this will ensure that one, that file structure is exactly the same every time, that all those launch demons are there, and that they're all in a running state or an enabled state. So if we come back over here and just run example uh, two, if I didn't already run this on my VM, it should apply all the changes. Uh, Chef running in a VM can be a little slow sometimes, um, especially if you're running Chef Zero runs. But in general, um, we make, oh yeah, it hasn't done any of that, so it's doing all of that live. We run, we configure about 800 things, like if you consider all the files and everything it runs, and our average runtime is only about 30 seconds, so um, it's, it's also very fast. So again, let's get into something a little bit more complex. Um, we deploy Monkey with Chef. Um, this is a sim more simplistic version of our Monkey cookbook, but you, you'll get the gist. Basically, we're specifying, um, let me close this up. We're um, Monkey right here. So uh, here we go, recipes default, this is where we are. We're specifying a Monkey version and a Monkey app version. Um, because the actual app has a given version. 
then we're creating any directory, uh, directories for monkey that it, monkey has a requirement for. And if you've used monkey before, it's all of those. We're doing that same pattern that you've seen over and over, and we are just iterating over that, ensuring that each of the directories are there. Um, and then this one is a new one. We're telling it to copy a remote directory that is stored within the, uh, the chef cookbook itself, and it's called uh, monkey and then monkey version. So you can imagine that if you had a test group, you could uh, specify conditionally that they get a different monkey version. So here it goes. This is the, you know, all the files that monkey are required. It's going to ensure that they all have the appropriate permissions and um, are on disk. And this is also kind of cool, because if we decided we wanted to create our own like fork of monkey and wanted to test it on our fleet before making a pull request, we could just uh, create an additional folder uh, structure in here, scope it to a given um, test segment of our fleet conditionally with the node object or the attributes file, and then we don't actually have to change any of this code. We can just change the, um, uh, the key value pair stored in the um, attributes file that we were looking at earlier. So here's all the launch daemons. We're doing very similar pattern that we saw earlier. Um, this is a custom resource provider that we built. I was hoping to get to some of that, um, but we won't have time. Basically what this is doing is it's using the remote file resource uh, that Chef provides to download a, well first, um, it does some Ruby code to validate whether or not a package needs to be installed or not because of its receipt and version. And if it isn't, it uses the remote file uh, package resource to download um, the package needed from one of our monkey servers and then it um, just installs it using the installer command. Um, we just specify the app, the version, um, the receipt, and a checksum because before we uh, run installer against the command, we want to validate that it's the right package. Um, again, here's uh, monkey agents and if you saw my Mac tech talk, we talked about a mistake we made where when we deployed monkey um, we didn't make our clients reboot. And what that meant was they didn't see the, the prompt for the first time. But now, because we're using Chef to deploy, um, and Chef has the logic to load the launch agents um, correctly, or, well, more, most importantly, this launch agent correctly, um, it will no longer require a reboot in our environment for the first install. And yeah, we're still coming down here, um, and we're just installing some extra paths, I mean, sorry, um, extra files to put Monkey in the correct paths. Um, if if we're on our first boot. We just image a machine. We flag that to Chef. So Chef knows to come by and also drop down the, uh, the hidden file for check and install at startup. So it'll apply all of its stuff before the login prompt ever comes up. Um, so now, this we actually do on the fly um, with every Chef run. And we will uh, dynamically generate what the monkey repo should be. Um, we're not doing this here, but uh, in our uh, node attribute, we know where the closest monkey server is and what their their manifest should be based on who they are or the region or you know wh whichever so but in this case we're just defining these as variables we're we're creating an array of dictionaries with key value pairs of here's the key here's the val well here's the key called key of the key that is stored within the um, the library press managed installs and it's a type of string, and then, you know, so forth, so forth. And then how many days between prompts? We do some funky stuff with our prompting, so we actually, we handle the prompting ourselves by changing this value um, dynamically. And then, so, again, very common pattern. We're iterating over each of the uh, dictionaries in this array, and we're using a open source uh, third-party LWRP, which is lightweight resource and provider, um, to do a, essentially, user's default on the, um, or you know, defaults right to the plist, and um, it is setting each of the prefs and it you know key value pairs here. It's actually really easy. But now um, updating the the version will just be you know essentially um, changing this version, adding a new folder, doing some testing, sharding the rollout, and then going from there. Um, yeah, we skipped over some stuff, but that's okay. Um, so, yeah, one second. Um, this is an example of some of the OHI code that you would write in a plugin. Um, this is a little bit more Ruby-esque. Um, 
there's some like boilerplate stuff we're calling you know ohi.plugin and we're passing it like what it's actually providing um, but in here the guts is like um, time C server equals and then we're just doing a shell out in Ruby we're, we're calling the system setup and then we're getting the network uh, time server and then uh, we're running the command and we're getting standard output and we're splitting it and getting the last thing that returned and then so now a part of our node object it'll be like node.cpe time server and if we are curious of whether or not it's the valid one or not it'll it'll just be defined there um, this is a simple down version of our file vault one but it's very similar you're just we're writing you know running some bash commands basically processing the the data getting it and putting it in a structured object that we can use throughout our the rest of our runs so another thing that we didn't talk about is typically your is generated by the admin and uploaded to a server or defined within your client configuration on the machine itself um, but we we generate our run list dynamically based on the chef run itself and we're not going to go into detail about this too much but um, basically this is what our run list consists of these three things it says set up chef validate that it has a good configuration it's uh, set up the agent that's running and this is also just defined what agent should run based on the OS and then again run the init meaning uh, this is where it's actually generating the run list by platform family so an example of this is like we're telling it to run this recipe called CP init uh, platform dot init and that is right um, here which is Mac OS on uh, Mac OS X underscore init and this is really just making an array that's all this is doing so, but conditionally if it's the first boot we're gonna add these two things and this is like a very simplistic version I just kinda threw it up real quick this goes out to all machines we're gonna be running these things um, if it's a laptop we could add a couple additional things if it was a desktop we could do a couple other things we're gonna log that out using the logger command we're going to log that to the chef log with that and then we're gonna iterate over that run list only grabbing the unique things in case something was added more than once um, and then with the uh, it as a recipe so we do include recipe so now it'll iterate over this entire you know um, array that we've compiled over over this one file and then selectively run things based on that so yeah that was a lot of stuff and um, let's go back to the slides real quick so um, actually so yeah monkey is just like we were saying an application and a whole bunch of flat files Right. You've seen that before. That was our, our fancy um, version of how we like it. Our, our, our own mascot is Nancat, so it's animated. Um, that's us like just explaining that, yeah, it's just a whole bunch of files and everything. Um, one other thing, because I actually do want to show just how fast. Um, CPD underscore monkey. So this is going to run, it's going to take just a second, but um, it's validating whether or not the entire monkey is installed, whether or not the launch demons are there, and it's going to fly back by really quickly, but this initial part that's going, it's compiling, uh, compiling the node object by running OHI. And you can specify and add additional plugins like you would with extended attributes or fa custom factor facts. Um, So um, this, the text that we're seeing um, is actually just the chef run and the chef command, but um, the underlying code is handled by um, a chef formatter, which can be completely customized to you. So if you wanted to see certain things or add additional things, you can get very gran uh, granular about what you see for each run. Um, this is just the very standard one. Um, I should have pre-cache some of this because it really does take a, a few seconds um. <laughs> I know 
know, as soon as I I, uh, I look away, it'll it'll start. Okay. Maybe we'll come back to that. Okay. But anyway, so um, like I was saying, that chef um, uh, formatter can be changed to any way you want. So customize all the things, right? And um, this is an example that someone did just to show the extremeness of the, what you can do with a chef handler. This is actually NANCAT running and expressing everything that it's doing by the numbers in the upper left or right here. So it'll actually just show that like these many things are getting updated. And this is one of our runs um, internally. But yeah, it's just running, flying through, and this is like the, of course, no one needs NANCAT as your chef out, uh, you know, output, but um, it's pretty, and uh, it just shows the, the, the amount of flexibility that you can have with chef. Okay, cool. So um, takeaways, which is also another dark slide. Um, the learning curve is very, uh, or can be very steep, but if you take one piece out of a time and then... Um, just um, really start with the documentation and their training. A lot of it's actually very good. It just won't be uh, applicable to you right away, but you can start to make comparisons and, and draw your, um, what you, how you could use some of that stuff in your environment on your clients instead of servers. Um, automate today what you don't want to have to do tomorrow, right? Like I don't want to have to remember how to do, you know, install launch team, and so I do it once and that I can just forget about it. Um, very customizable, very scalable. We talked about that. Um, reuse and share. We um, are going to. Um, we're dedicated to um, commit as much as we can back to Chef and to our own repo. So you'll, you know, just keep looking forward to that. Um, and then stop scripting, start coding. Um, if it's if it's longer than ten file, uh, ten lines in Bash, think about something else. Maybe Chef. And then uh, what would you do if you weren't afraid, right? Uh, yeah, this is some of the groups that we're in on Facebook. You can join MacBrain. We do uh, live streams once a month, and um, you're also welcome to attend. We host them at everywhere from Facebook, Twitter, Square, like all the like local places. Um, so if you're interested, come join or stop by. We always hang out in uh, OSX server. We're, I also created the Think Tank group, which is not Mac focused. It's just all IT, uh, ITV, or sorry, IT. And then. That's our GitHub. Um, we'll be putting up Chef stuff at some point, and then that's our IT page. Yeah, I'm curious if that thing ever finished. Yeah, but yeah, it's a, yeah. So yeah, that was that was all the all the stuff, all the uh, the monkey. Cool. Um, I don't think we have any time for questions, or do we? Sure. Okay, cool. So questions. Sure, we do. Sorry, there's a lot. Nobody wants to go have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to ask a question? Skip? I, I don't know if it's quite related to that, but uh -huh. I'm, like, amazed. I'm amazed at the amount of software. So you guys wrote Fabricator? Uh, we didn't write Fabricator, okay. but Facebook wrote Fabricator. And now it's been, well, uh, the initial version. Now it's um, its own company, and they offer support oh, and wow. stuff. But it was okay. originally open source by Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Cool. Any other questions? Any other questions? Wade, you got a question. Okay. Ben, David, no? So Solarize. Oh, yeah. oh no. I can repeat too. What is a microphone? Yeah. So for user accounts and that, like you know, what was that really hot mic? Um, user accounts uh, with Puppet resources, right? You could, you could. Did you have to do anything crazy to make a Chef create Mac user accounts? So, actually, that's a good point. Um, I talked about some of the stuff that we we had, um, you know, wrote a PR for and they, they accepted. But we also did find uh, bugs here and there. One of them was around changing the passwords on certain versions of OS X. Um, they were very quick about fixing it. Um, we, we noticed a bug. They, like, immediately jumped on it and, ha um, you know, had a fix for us, like, really, really good t turnaround. So, yes, we do create accounts for, like, service accounts and stuff like that. We do we do have um, an admin account that we randomize per machine, um, and we're using that. But typically, we're not creating accounts um, very often. We have a few examples, but it's rare. But Chef can do it. Yeah, Chef works out of the box. Out of the box with, to yeah. do it. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, so, out of the box, um, like, files, services is, like, solid now. Um, users, um, I there's there is some example of profiles, but I actually want to take the time to really 
do something nice with that. And uh, yeah, it's it's been awesome. I really haven't had too many bugs. There, there's little things, but their support has been um, just amazing. So I'm sure at some point you might come up with something or just want to comment about anything you did see. Um, find me. I am more than willing to talk to you guys or if you want to talk to, about IRC or I'll even extend it to if you guys want to, um, if you're going to do this on your own but you just like get really stuck, reach out to me on IRC or on Facebook and then I'll, I'll help whoever needs it. Yeah. To, to an extent. <laughs> <laughs> so any more questions for Mike? Thank no you, Mike. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Mike. <laughs>